with just cotton Look at it flopping That's my Welcome to Story Hour. This edition of Story Hour is really special. My son Timothy is here with me today to share a couple of his favorite stories. Not, not now, said the cow. One day a little black crow spotted a sack of corn seed lying on the ground. Ka ka, he crowed, just what we need, a sack of seeds. So the little black crow flew back to the farm. Ka ka, he crowed, look what I found just laying around. Who will help me plant the seeds in the ground? Not now, mood cow. I'm asleep, brought the sheep. Oh, cock crow. Then I will do it all by myself. Soon the sprouts were tall and green, but weeds were growing in between. Who will help me put pull the weeds? Nix, nix, peeped the chicks. I'm asleep, brought the sheep. Not now, mood cow. Oh, cock crow. Then I will do it all by myself. The rows of corn grew tall and thick. Soon fat green ears were ready to pick. Who will help me pick the corn? Why me, braided donkey? Nix, nix, peep the chicks. I'm asleep, bought the sheep. Not now, mood cow. Oh, cock crow. Then I will do it all by myself. Crow picked the ears one by one. And later that night, his work was done. Who will help me shuck the corn? Don't be funny, squealed the bunny. Why me, bear donkey? Nix, nix, peeped the chicks. I'm asleep, bought the sheep. Not now, mood cow. Oh, cock crow. Then I will do it all by myself. Now all the corn was still on the cob. And take it off was a big, big job. Who will help me shell the corn? Not my job, grunted hog. Don't be funny, squealed the bunny. Why me, bear donkey? Nix, nix, peep chicks. I'm asleep, bud, the sheep. Not now, moo cow. Oh, cockroach, then I will do it all by myself. The corn, the corn, then then Crow put the corn into a pot. What we need, he said, is a fly that's hot. Who will help me gather wood? I can't do that, meowed the cat. Not my job, grunted hog. Don't be funny, squealed the bird. Why me, bear donkey? Nix, nix, feed the chicks. I must sleep, brought the sheep. Not now, mood cow. Oh, cod crow, then I will do it all by myself. Soon the wood was burning hot, and the little black crow put a top on the pot. Who will help me shake the pot? I don't dare, whinnied mare. I can't do that, meowed the cat. Not my job, grunted talk. Don't be funny, spilled the bunny. Why me, bear donkey? Nick snicks, peep the chicks. I'm asleep by the sheep. Not now, mood cow. Oh, cock crow. Then I will do it all by myself. Soon the 
Little Black Crow shook the corn in the pot. He shook it and shook it till the pot got hot. And suddenly inside the pot, suddenly inside that pot, the corn got hot and would not stop. It just kept going. Pop, 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 pop. Where's my share, we need mirror? I'll take that me out the cat. That's my job, grunted hog. Yummy, yummy, squealed the bunny. For me, for me, bear donkey. First licks, peeped the chicks. Let's eat, pa sheep. Oh, wow, mood cow. No, no, cod crow. I planted the seeds. I pulled the weeds. When the corn was tall, I picked it all. I shook it and shelled it and built the fire. I shook the pot till it got hot. And now I'll eat this nice hot popcorn all by myself. I hope you enjoyed Not Now Mood the Cow. This is a story that's very, very similar to the little red hen. Not Now Mood the Cow. Our next story is called When the TV Broke, and I'm sure so many of you can really, really come with this one. It would be a disaster if the TV broke during summer vacation. Let's listen to Timothy Reed, When the TV Broke. Jeffrey watched television every day of the week. Jeffrey watched on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, and on Saturday. On Sunday, right in the middle of a gorilla movie, the TV made a loud buzz. The picture faded and the screen went blank. Jeffrey's mother turned all the dials, but nothing happened. On Monday, Jeffrey's dad put the TV into the car. Jeffrey sat on the sofa. Now he had nothing to do. On Tuesday, Jeffrey asked, is the TV fixed yet? Not yet, Jeffrey's mom said. Maybe tomorrow. On Wednesday, Jeffrey said, it's tomorrow. Is the TV fixed yet? Not yet, she said, maybe tomorrow. On Thursday, Jeffrey said, is the TV fixed yet? Not yet, Mom said, maybe tomorrow. What are you doing, asked Jeffrey's sister. Nothing much, he said. Will you read to me, she asked. Okay, said Jeffrey. Then it was Friday. Jeffrey found some boxes. He found paint, scissors, crayons, and glue too. What are you doing, asked Jeffrey's sister. Nothing much, he said. What are you doing now? Asked Jeffrey's sister. Nothing much, he said. On Saturday, Dad called. I'm home. Come and watch the TV. It's all fixed. Not now, Dad, said Jeffrey. I'm busy. Maybe tomorrow. See, Jeffrey learned that there is so much magic in reading and doing other things, 
he didn't have to spend his entire week watching television. This was a story called When the TV Broke. The book is called The World of the Sea. He is the author and illustrator of this book, having written it for the Young Authors Conference held earlier this year in May. Let's listen to Timothy read The World of the Sea. Once upon a time there lived a girl. She went to play on the beach with her dog. The girl's name was Mary. Her dog saw a mermaid. The mermaid's name was Kelly. I hate my book. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kelly told Mary and her dog. Ruff, ruff, said the dog. Hi, said Mary. Come down with me, said Kelly. Okay, said Mary. Ruff, ruff, said the dog, getting mad. We'll go and play under the sea, said Kelly and Mary. Ruff, went the dog, going nuts. He wanted to play on the beach. Then Mary and her dog turned into mermaids. Oh, this is beautiful, said Mary. Ruff, ruff, said the dog. How do you like it, Mary asked her dog. Oh, just beautiful, said the dog. Okay, I'll admit it. I'll tell the truth. I feel sick. You can talk, asked Mary and Kelly. Of course I can talk, said the dog. Just then, a little crab walked by and pinched the duck. Ooh, said the duck. Ha, 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 said the girls. Oh, my aching butt, said the dog. Serves you right, said the crab. Ruff, ruff, said the dog, going to rip off the crab's head. Then Mary yelled, stop. Then the crab said, nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I guess I'll go eat worms, big fat juicy ones, little skinny little glue ones. I'll bite off their heads and suck their guts. Then the crab died. Ha ha ha, said the dog. And then turned into a boy, the end. That was Timothy's own creation called The World of the Sea. This book was written for the Young Authors Conference held earlier this year. Timothy was the first grade representative from his school, Sun Grove Montessori. We continue the story hour with stories all set for the summer. The first one's called Because a Little Bug Went Kachoo by Rosetta Stone, illustrated by Michael Frith. You may not believe it, but here's how it happened. One fine summer morning, a little bug sneezed. Kachoo! Because of that sneeze, a little seed dropped. Because that seed dropped, a worm got hit. Because he got hit, that worm got mad. Because he got mad, he kicked a tree. Because of that kick, a coconut dropped. Because that nut dropped, a turtle got bopped. Because he got bopped, that turtle named Jake fell on his back with a splash in the lake. Because of that splash, a hen got wet. Because she got wet, that hen got mad. Because she got mad, that hen kicked a bucket. Because of that kick, the bucket went up. Because it went up, the bucket came down. 
because it came down, it hit Farmer Brown, and that bucket got stuck on his head. Because it got stuck, Farmer Brown phoned for help. Because of his phone call, policemen came speeding. Because they were speeding, they hit a big stone, and so one policeman flew up all alone. Because he flew up, he had to come down. And because he came down on the boat, Mary Lou, and because he hit hard, he went right on through. He made a big hole in the boat, Mary Lou. Because of that hole, the boat started to sink. And because it was sinking well, what do you think? Everyone, everyone started to yelp and Mrs. Brown called on the phone for more help. Because of her phone call, more help came fast. They tied a strong rope to the Mary Lou's mast. And because of that rope, the boat didn't go down, but it had to be fixed, so they started for town. And because they went there, it's true, I'm afraid they ran right into a circus parade. And that started something they'll never forget. And as far as I know, it is going on yet. And that's how it happened. Believe me, it's true. Because, just because, a small bug went ka -choo. Because a little bug went ka -choo by Rosetta Stone, illustrated by Michael Frith. Summer is a very special time. Many children go visiting during the summertime. I know a favorite place of mine to go visiting when I was little was to Grandma's house. And that's what this story is all about. It's called Grandma's House. It's a story by Elaine Moore with pictures by Elise Primavera. I like summer best because that is when we go to Grandma's house. My mother drives our car there and the trip takes two days. I sit up front so I can be the first to see the house. When we finally arrive, my mother parks our car and I run to where Grandma is waiting. Surprise, I yell, even though I know she has been expecting us. When Grandma hugs me, she smells of fresh powder. And when she steps back to laugh, it looks to me like her work shirt is laughing too. My mother can stay at Grandma's for three days. Then she must go home again. Her job is in an office and her boss will miss her. She says, only I can spend the summer with Grandma. Every morning after my mother is gone, Grandma takes me to her porch. She sets a glass of water, a comb, and ribbons on a green wooden table and stands behind me to plait my hair. I hear her dip the comb into the glass of water. Then she runs it through my hair in a way that doesn't pull or hurt. When the water sprinkles the back of my neck, she smooths the droplets with her fingers. Afterward, Grandma ties a ribbon to the tip of each braid. One morning, while we were on the porch, I see rabbits in Grandma's garden. Look, Grandma, I shout. Those rabbits are eating our strawberries. I clatter down the steps and wave my arms like two windmills. The rabbits disappear. Then Grandma leads me to the shed. She takes two buckets off the shelf and hands me the one that it has my name on it, Kim. Most rabbits don't eat berries, she says. They eat clover. Not your rabbits, I say laughing. Grandma laughs too. We pick the berries, leaving some for the hungry rabbits. The rest we take inside. We slice some to put on top of our cereal. Later, we will make shortcake and strawberry jam. 
On the hottest days, Grandma and I go to the mall to cool off. Sometimes while we're there, we try on funny hats and make faces in the mirror. Sometimes we go to Chess's ice cream parlor. One day after we've ordered our ice cream, Grandma tells the waiter, it's my birthday. Grandma, I say, my birthday is in December. But Kim, she answers, I missed your birthday in December. You were in school and I was here. I could only celebrate long distance. I think you should have two birthdays, one at home with your mother and a half birthday in the summertime. The waiter must have thought so too, for when he comes with our Sundays, he brings a birthday hat for me. Then everyone in chesses sings the birthday song, Grandma loudest of all. The next day after breakfast, Grandma shakes her head and sighs. Have you seen? The birds are eating our peaches, she says. We'll need to trick them if we want any for ourselves. Grandma shows me how to punch holes in shiny foil plates. Then we string yarn through the holes and tie the plates to the tree. Grandma says when the plates reflect the sun, the birds will think the tree is on fire and stay away from the peaches. But the birds are not fooled. That's because it's cloudy, Grandma explains. But you'll see, tomorrow will be sunny. Then we'll outwit those birds. Grandma is right. The next day is sunny. But she's wrong about the birds. They're still eating our peaches. While Grandma shoes them away, I pull a basket out from the shed. Under the peach tree, it is cool and shady and the air heavy and sweet smelling. We pick the peaches the birds did not touch. That's okay, Grandma, I say when I see our basket is only half full. Peaches aren't my favorite. They were last year, Kim. Grandma answers, you couldn't get enough of them. Then her face brightens. You must just wait until you taste the plums, she says. They're not ready yet, but when they are, they'll be the best of all. Grandma has two plum trees. Every day from then on, I count 12 not ready plums. The plums are growing bigger, I tell Grandma. They'll be ready soon, Grandma promises. Too soon. Why too soon, I ask. Grandma puts her arms around me. My plums are the last fruits of summer, she says. After we pick them, it will be time for you to leave. Then I won't see you until next year. That night, when I go to sleep, I think how my summer at Grandma's is like her garden. It begins with strawberries and ends with plums. I wish that I never had to leave. One morning near summer's end, it is late when I wake up. At first, I cannot find Grandma. She's not in her bed or in the kitchen either. Then I hear her talking in her outside voice. I go to the porch where I see her standing under the oak tree and peering up into its branches. Suddenly, I notice a squirrel running fast through the grass and carrying something round and red-purple in his mouth. He races past Grandma and scampers up into the tree. Grandma, I shout, the squirrels are eating our plums. For the rest of the morning, Grandma and I do not feel like talking. At noon, we fill a tray with sandwiches, milk, and cookies that we carry outside. As we eat, I think about Grandma's garden. I know that tomorrow after my mother comes, I will not be with Grandma again until it is strawberry time. I think Grandma knows this too. Finally, Grandma says, there's only one thing to do, Kim. What's that, Grandma? I ask. Grandma does not answer right away. We climb into her truck 
and drive along a straight road. Then we turn onto one that is bumpy and has sharp turns. Grandma parks a truck near a large sign and we climb out. A man with a brown leathery face tips his cap to us. Grandma nods hello. We've shared strawberries with rabbits and peaches with birds, she says to him, but the plums, why the squirrels took all of our plums. They didn't leave a one. So I want two more plum trees. Then next summer when my granddaughter comes to visit, I'll have two trees for us and two for the squirrels. Soon there should be plums enough for everyone. The man smiles a tiny smile. We follow him down a shady path where there are pictures tied to every tree. We look for plum trees with fruit that is the darkest purple and the reddest red. After we make our choices, the man loads them in grandma's truck. Waving, we beep our horn as we drive away. That night after supper, Grandma and I dig two holes. We put in soft dirt first, then the trees. We spread the roots in a circle. Finally, we water them and smooth the dirt all around. When we are finished, Grandma points to the oak tree. I turn and see the squirrels sitting on their favorite low branch. I can hear their chatter. Oh, no, you're not. Grandma says, shaking her finger. These trees are my granddaughters. Next year, you'll have trees of your own. Grandma and I laugh. We know it's not the trees that are important. It is Grandma and it is me. Afterward, Grandma and I go inside. We wash up because we're going to Chessie's. Tonight, it is Grandma's half birthday and it is my turn to sing loudest of all. Grandma's House, the story by Elaine Moore with pictures by Elise Primavera. I always like stories that remind me of other stories. This one reminds me of a favorite of mine called The Mitten. This story is called Mushroom in the Rain. It's by Mira Ginsberg with pictures by Jose Aruego and Ariane Dewey. One day an ant was caught in the rain. Where can I hide, he wondered. He saw a tiny mushroom peeking out of the ground in a clearing and he hid under it. He sat there waiting for the rain to stop, but the rain came down harder and harder. A wet butterfly crawled up to the mushroom. Cousin Ant, let me come in from the rain. I'm so wet, I cannot fly. How can I let you in, said the ant. There's barely room enough for one. It doesn't matter, said the butterfly, better crowded than wet. The ant moved over and made room for the butterfly. The rain came down harder and harder. A mouse ran up. Let me in under the mushroom. I'm drenched to the bone. How can we let you in? There's no more room here. Just move a little closer. They huddled closer and let the mouse in. And the rain came down and came down and would not stop. A little sparrow hopped up to the mushroom crying, My feathers are dripping, my wings are so tired. Let me in under the mushroom to dry out and rest until the rain stops. But there's no room in here. Please move over just a little. They moved over and there was room enough for the sparrow. Then a rabbit hopped into the clearing and saw the mushroom. Oh, hide me, he cried. Save me, a fox is chasing me. Poor rabbit, said the ant. Let's crowd ourselves a little more and 
take him in. As soon as they hid the rabbit, the fox came running. Have you seen the rabbit? Which way did he go? he asked. We've not seen him. The fox came nearer and sniffed. There is a rabbit smell around. Is he hiding here? You silly fox! How could a rabbit get in here? Don't you see there isn't any room? The fox turned up his nose, flicked his tail, and ran off. By then the rain was over. The sun looked out from behind the clouds, and everyone came out from under the mushroom, bright and merry. The ant looked at his neighbors. How could this be? At first I had hardly room enough under the mushroom just for myself. And in the end, all five of us were able to sit under it. Ha! 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 Somebody laughed loudly behind them. They turned and saw a fat green frog sitting on top of the mushroom, shaking his head at them. Ha! Ha! said the frog. Don't you know what happens to a mushroom in the rain? And he hopped away, still laughing. The ant, the butterfly, the mouse, the sparrow, and the rabbit looked at one another, then at the mushroom. And suddenly they knew why there was enough room under the mushroom for them all. Do you know? Can you guess? What happens to a mushroom when it rains? I'm sure you can guess. It grows! It gets bigger. The story of the mushroom in the rain by Mira Ginsberg with pictures by Jose Aruego and Ariane Dewey. Summer is indeed a special time. There's so much that people do during the summertime, and this book tells of one such activity. It's called Camp Out. It's a story by Joyce Maynard with pictures by Steve Bethel. We're going to sleep outside tonight, Audrey told Charlie. It's called a camp out. We're going to Big Bear Island. Will there be bears? asked Charlie. Can I bring my sword? No bears, said Audrey. Will my bed be outside? asked Charlie. We get to sleep in sleeping bags, Audrey explained, even baby Willie. It's not bedtime yet, said Charlie. I just had lunch. Later, said Audrey. You'll see. The family drove for a long time. Dad started singing, This land is your land. Know what, Dad? said Audrey. This highway does look like a ribbon. This road looks like a snake, said Charlie. I'm going to eat you up. Grrr. Snakes don't growl, Char, said Audrey. She pointed a finger at his head and made circles in the air. You're a nut, she said. I'm a boy, said Charlie. I'm a big boy. Their friends Desmond and Tyson and their dad George were already at the lake when the family arrived. Tyson was wading in the water looking for frogs. I just missed catching a big one, he called out. What a relief, said Audrey. The birch bark canoe with dad and Desmond and Charlie headed out first for Big Bear Island. Then George and Audrey followed in the green canoe, and Mom and Tyson and Willie trailed behind in the red one. A grown-up sat in the back of each canoe to steer. Audrey had to keep switching her paddle from side to side because her arms got tired. Up ahead, Desmond and Dad were counting their strokes. One, two, three, dip, row, back. One, two, three three, dip, row, back. They heard something go, woo, woo, woo. A loon, said George. He cupped his hands around his mouth and made a noise that sounded 
almost the same. The loon dived under water. Dad and Desmond were already unloading the gear from the birch bark canoe when the others reached the island. I wonder what happened to the pine cone man I left here last year, said Audrey. Charlie was running back and forth along the path from the shore to the campsite as the sun slipped lower in the sky. Does everybody have a job to do, asked George. We'll put up the tent. We'll get firewood. Me too. I'll build the fire. I'll wrap the potatoes in foil and make hamburgers. Sizzle, pop, crackle. Let's eat. After dinner, the kids got two marshmallows apiece. One of Audrey's fell off her stick into the fire. Everyone watched it puff up big and then crinkle away to ashes. Charlie rubbed his eyes. Time to sleep, said Mom, giving Charlie his bear. Mom led Charlie to the tent. When you're camping, she explained, you don't wear pajamas to bed, just the clothes you have on. It was cold out away from the campfire. She took off his shoes and set them just outside the tent. She snuggled him in his sleeping bag. Audrey and Tyson and Desmond will come along soon, said Mom, and Willie and the grown-ups will be sleeping nearby. Then Charlie was alone, looking at the ceiling of the tent. Outside, wind rustled the leaves. Mommy, he cried, there's trees in my tent. Mommy! Audrey ran into the tent to comfort her brother. Mom followed closely behind. Those are shadows, Audrey told him. Mom sang him his favorite song. The fox went out on a chilly night, and the other children came to listen. Desmond made a fox shadow on the side of the tent with his fingers. Then Dad crawled inside the tent. Guess what's in my hand, he said. An M&M? asked Audrey hopefully. Nope, said Dad, uncurling his fingers to show a little green light. It's a glow worm, he said. It can be your nightlight. It was dark everywhere. The water lapped against the shore. Crickets sang. One loon called to another. Then the sun came up. Desmond jumped out of his sleeping bag and ran out of the tent. The ground was wet with dew. Where's Willie? asked Charlie. Let's go catch frogs, said Tyson. Too early, Audrey groaned, burrowing down in her sleeping bag. Come on, said Desmond, you too. George was building up the campfire, and Dad was making fishing poles for Charlie and Audrey. Let's see if you have some pea, said Mom, leading Charlie to a spot behind some bushes. Then we can go for a swim. Audrey took charge of breakfast. You measure the pancake mix, she told Desmond, and I'll break the eggs. Tyson poured in the milk. Desmond dumped in the blueberries. Audrey plopped batter on the griddle. Tyson was in charge of flipping. They named each pancake according to what it looked like. One was boot, another was jellyfish, another was dump truck. When they were done eating, they swished their plates and forks in the lake to get them clean. Who wants to go fishing? asked George. Me, said Charlie. Me, said Audrey. Me, said Desmond. Not me, said Tyson. I'm going to look for frogs. Desmond showed Audrey his tackle box full of glittery lures and gave her one. George tried to show Charlie how to throw his line in the water. Oh no, Desmond hooted. He threw his whole rod in. Audrey found an odd-shaped rock. Watch this, said George. He threw it on a bigger rock, breaking it to pieces. Arrowhead, said Desmond. I'm going to bury one, said Audrey, to dig up next summer. Then it was time to pack up and head back across the lake. 
everyone helped carry the net. The tent, knapsacks, picnic baskets, sleeping bags and garbage to the beach. Dad poured a pot full of water on the coals to make sure the fire was out. It sizzled and smoked. He took one last look around the campsite and bent down to pick up Willie. Don't worry, he said. We would never forget you. Paddling away from Big Bear Island, they saw motorboats bringing families to shore, all dressed up for church. Mom and Audrey, in the green canoe this time, sang white coral bells and amazing grace while Charlie dozed. Desmond and Dad were up ahead again, counting strokes. One, two, three, dip, row, back. A loon called George and Tyson answered. Their blue car and George's red truck were waiting by the shore. The men beached the canoes. Tyson took off after frogs again. Desmond and Audrey fed some ducks that had followed them back to shore. Charlie woke up. Time to get out of the boat, camper boy, said Mom. But I don't want to go home, said Charlie, starting to cry. Just then, George came out from a wooded spot near the truck. If everyone's very helpful packing up the cars, he said, I'll show you an amazing nature surprise. He led them into a clearing and pointed at a dead tree. Look! The surprise! There, attached to a limb, was something orange and bumpy and speckled and ruffly. It's monster brains! It's alive! I saw it move! Yuck! What is it? A mushroom or fungus of some sort, said George. Tyson reached out to touch it. Don't! Audrey yelled. It could be poisonous. Remember what happened to the elephant that ate the polka dot mushroom in Babar? Audrey's right, said George. Just look, don't touch. We leave it for other campers to find. Time to go, said Mom. But first, Dad lined everybody up next to the fungus tree to take a picture. I'll set the timer so I can be in the picture too, said Dad. He put the camera on a rock and pushed a button. The camera started ticking. Then Dad scrambled back and found a spot next to Mom. Everybody make a noise like a loon, said Mom. Ooh, even Willie joined in. The camera went click. Can we come back next summer? Absolutely. Camp out. Story by Joyce Maynard and pictures by Steve Bethel. The story all set for summer. It's called McElligot's Pool. Young man, laughed the farmer, you're sort of a fool. You'll never catch fish in McElligot's Pool. The pool is too small, and you might as well know it. When people have junk, here's the place that they throw it. You might catch a boot, or you might catch a can. You might catch a bottle, but listen, young man, if you sat 50 years with your worms and your wishes, you'd grow a long beard, long before you'd catch fishes. Hmm, answered Marco. It may be you're right. I've been here three hours without one single bite. There might be no fish, but again, well, there might, cause you never can tell what goes on down below. This pool might be bigger than you or I know. This might be a pool like I've read of in books, connected to one of those underground brooks an underground river that starts here and flows right under the pasture. And then, well, who knows? It might go along down where no one can see, right under State Highway 203, 
right under the wagons, right under the toes of Mrs. Umbroso, who's hanging out clothes. It might keep on flowing, perhaps, who can tell? Right under the people in Schneiden's hotel, right under the grass where they're playing croquet, then under the mountains and far, far away. This might be a river. Now mightn't it be? Connecting McElligot's pool with the sea. Then maybe some fish might be swimming toward me. If such a thing could be, they certainly would be. Some very smart fellow might point out the way to the place where I'm fishing. And that's why I say, if I wait long enough, if I'm patient and cool, who knows what I'll catch in McElligot's pool. I might catch a thin fish. I might catch a stout fish. I might catch a short or a long, long drawn out fish. Any kind, any shape, any color or size. I might catch some fish that would open your eyes. I won't be surprised if a dogfish appears, complete with a collar and long floppy ears, woofing along and perhaps he might chase a whole lot of catfish right straight to this place. I might catch a fish with a pinwheel-like tail. I might catch a fish who has fins like a sail. I might catch some young fish, some high-jumping friskers. I might catch an old one with long flowing whiskers. I might catch a fish with a long curly nose. I might catch a fish like a rooster that crows. I might catch a fish with a checkerboard belly or even a fish made of strawberry jelly. I might catch a seahorse. No, mightn't I now. I might catch a fish who is partly a cow. From fish from the tropics, all sunburned and hot, might decide to swim up. Well, they might, might they not? Racing up north for a chance to get cool, full steam ahead for McElligot's pool. Some Eskimo fish from beyond Hudson Bay might decide to swim down, might be headed this way. It's a pretty long trip, but they might and they may. I might catch an eel, well I might, it depends. A long twisting eel with a lot of strange bends and oddly enough, with a head on both ends. One doesn't catch this kind of fish as a rule, but the chances are fine in McElligot's pool. I might catch a fish with a terrible grouch, or an Australian fish with a kangaroo's pouch. Who wants to catch small ones like mackerel or trout? Say, I'll catch a sawfish with such a long snout that he needs an assistant to help him about. If I wait long enough, if I'm patient and cool, who knows what I'll catch in McElligot's pool. Some roughneck old lobster all gristle and muscle might grab at my bait then. Would I have a tussle? To land one so tough might take two or three hours, but the next might be easy. The kind that likes flowers. I might catch some sort of a fast moving bloke who zips through the waves with an overarm stroke. I might and I may. And that's really no joke. A fish even faster, a fish if you please, who slides down the sides of strange islands on skis. He might ski on over and pay me a visit. That's not impossible, really. Now, is it? Some circus fish, fish from an acrobat school, 
might stage a big show in McElligot's pool. Or I might catch a fish from a stranger place yet, from the world's highest river in far off Tibet, where the falls are so steep that it's dangerous to ride them. So the fish put on shoots and they float down beside them. From the world's deepest ocean, from way down below, from down in the mud where the deep divers go, from down in the mire and the muck and the murk, I might catch some fish who are all going gluck. Whales! I'll catch whales. Yes, a whole herd of whales, all spouting their spouts and all thrashing their tails. I'll catch 50 whales and I'll stop for the day because there's nothing that's bigger than whales, so they say. Still, of course, it might be that there is something bigger, some sort of a kind of a thingamajigger. A fish that's so big, if you know what I mean, that he makes a whale look like a tiny sardine. Oh, the sea is so full of a number of fish. If a fellow is patient, he might get his wish. And that's why I think that I'm not such a fool when I sit here and fish in McElligot's Pool by Dr. Seuss. Summer is a wonderful time for all sorts of activities. Going fishing, going to the beach, going camping, visiting friends and relatives who live far away. It is also a marvelous time to just let your imagination run wild. Here's a story called, Can I Get There From My Room? by Elizabeth Lewis. It's illustrated by Bruce Lemerice. Michael was a terrific boy in many ways. He was smart, strong, he had good friends, and he made decisions very carefully. But Michael had one fault. He was moody. There were some days when Michael did not want to do anything. On this sunny Saturday morning in June, there was more going on outside Michael's room than inside. Outside, it was a busy summer day. Inside Michael's room, the train stood silently on the track. The books were left open on the floor, and a paint set sat near a half-finished picture. Michael could hear his friends shouting and laughing as they played outside, but he didn't want to join them. Michael and his loyal dog, Max, were staying indoors today. This did not please Max. Aren't you going out today? asked his mother through the door of his room. No, answered Michael. Why not? Because I'm not leaving my room today. That's why. Well, wouldn't Max like to go outside? Yes, Max did want to go out. He had already tried to make Michael play, but finally gave up and sat down on his favorite rug. He had seen Michael like this before. Michael would play soon, but when? No, Max is staying with me, Michael said. Right, Max? Are you going to paint? asked his mother. No, I like clay modeling now. Are you going to play with your train? No, I'm bored with my train. Will you be reading your books? I read them last week. Then you must be waiting for Sam to come over today. Sam's a dope, said Michael. Michael, why would you want to just sit in your room on a beautiful sunny day? Because, shouted Michael, I don't want to leave my room and that's that. I thought you were planning a trip to the moon today, said his mother. 
Can I get there from my room? asked Michael. I'll go if I can get there from my room. Your room? His mother was very surprised. I suppose if you put on your space helmet and space suit, you could get to the moon from your room. Michael looked at his spacesuit and helmet lying in a heap in the corner of his room. He remembered the day he and Max pretended they were the world's most famous astronauts. No, not today, said Michael, shaking his head. I'm tired of going to the moon. Yesterday you said you and Max were going to the Wild West. Can I get there from my room? Michael's mother did not answer his question this time. He looked at the cowboy hat hanging on the rack in his room and thought about the day he pretended he was a cowboy. He and Max saw hold-up men robbing people in a stagecoach. They ran to the rescue and were heroes. No, not today, said Michael. I want to go someplace new and I want to go there from my room. That's silly, said his mother. No, it's not, said Michael. Max decided to take a nap until Michael changed his mind. Michael looked at Max who started making small whimpering noises in his sleep. His ears and tail were twitching. Max was dreaming about running in the country. Michael, said his mother, you can't just sit in your room when there are so many places to explore and things to do. Like where? Like what? asked Michael. How about the circus? You enjoyed it last year. Can I get there from my room? You should stop asking that silly question, said his mother. Going to the circus is not like pretending to go to the moon or the wild west. It's fun to be in the tent with all the other children, hearing music and cheering the circus acts. Michael thought about everything he had seen at the circus. No, I don't think I'll be going out today, he said. Well then, what are you going to do in your room all day long? Think. Why don't you think at Willow's Pond? I can't get there from my room. Michael? It would be much better to walk there with Max, said his mother crossly. You could fish while you lie under a willow tree. Max thought this was a wonderful idea, but Michael was not so sure. What if there are no fish? Besides, I can't think and fish at the same time. Hmm, said his mother, then I have no ideas. Michael and Max sat in silence. It would have to be a pretty special event to get Michael out today. Suddenly, Max ran to the window barking. Sam was out there with a new boy that Michael had never seen before. Hey, Mickey, this is Arthur, Sam yelled up. His family just moved here and his dad is building a tree house in his yard, so come on out. A tree house, said Michael. Now that appealed to him. Neat, oh, I'll be out in five seconds. Michael, Max, Sam, and Arthur ran all the way to Arthur's backyard. They spent the morning helping Arthur's dad finish building. They sawed and hammered and sawed. We could start a club and have secret meetings up here, said Michael as they finally climbed inside. We could be private detectives, said Arthur, and this could be our office. We could bring our sleeping bags and stay all night, said Sam. The boys played together all day, and Michael had a great time. Just think, Max, said Michael on their way home. We have a new friend, and Sam, you and I will be going to play with him in his treehouse all the time now. I sure can't get there from my room, but who cares? Can I get there from my room? By Elizabeth Lewis, with pictures by Bruce Lemaris.